Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, this is Redberry Leo here, and welcome back to another quick Civil Air Patrol video. In today's video, we are talking about SUAS and a quick introduction to the program. And so with me, I have a guest instructor, his name is Martin, and he is very experienced with SUAS in Civil Air Patrol. And so he is an instructor for drones, in addition to being a mission pilot, a technician, and he just has a lot of knowledge that I wanted to be able to share with you all because I'm not a subject matter expert in SUAS, which is the Small Unmanned Aerial Systems um, program that Civil Air Patrol has. So I wanted to bring someone in who he volunteered to come in and talk to us all today. So I hope you all enjoy this quick introduction to SUAS. Hello everyone and welcome to another Civil Air Patrol video. Today I have a very special guest. I have Martin with me here today. Sir, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, today we are going to be talking about SUAS. And so Martin, if you could talk to us a little bit about what what is the SUAS program? Sure. So the SUAS program is, uh, so first off, I guess I should tell everyone that SUAS stands for Small Unmanned Aerial Systems. Um, essentially, they are drones. Um, but Civil Air Patrol has decided that SUAS is how they're going to refer to them. So that's what we, that's what we call them. Yep. Uh, drones are essentially um, small small little remote controlled vehicles primarily quadcopters is what cap uses although we do have uh two fixed wing that we use as well mm -hmm. uh the fixed wing are primarily mapping drones so we send them up to do mapping of areas like beaches to look for beach erosion we send them up to do mapping of um, any area that might have been affected by like a hurricane to get you know the the damage assessment and things like that done so I don't fly them for the most part. I primarily fly the quadcopters because they're so much more fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but the fixed wing ones are are good for for what they do, which is really the mapping. Mm -hmm. uh, the quadcopters are the small uh, drones. We have a whole different plethora of them in our inventory, mm. but we are slowly moving toward the Skydio brand of products because we have a deal with Skydio. Okay. Uh, so for Skydio, primarily what we use is the Skydio Two is what we use as our our basic trainer. Uh, the nice thing is that it's a very simple drone. Every unit should should eventually get one once you have a qualified mission pilot, a qualified technician, and you are an incident command post. And we will be talking about that in a future video. So if you're not sure how to get to those qualifications, we'll talk about that in a future video. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, so uh, once once you have that, you, you basically can can acquire the drones from CAP, and then you can start flying them. But having said that, you don't need to fly the Skydio. You can fly any drone you want to get to, mm. to, to start, you know, practicing with. And there are many out there. There are many different options. Really what they are is they're flying camera platforms. And that's the thing to consider them the most, the, the most important part is they're flying camera platforms. The big difference between the trainer that we use, which is the, the Skydio 2, and the final drone that, that you use for CAP missions, which is the Skydio X2D, is really the endurance, the size, and the camera that it uses. Mm. So the Skydio X2D has a longer endurance because it's got a bigger battery. It okay. can fly further, which is both good and bad. Um, it has, uh, it's, it's bigger in size, which is also good and bad. And the camera is both a regular camera and a forward-looking infrared camera, which is really cool mm. to play with. So obviously that has a lot of implications for what we can do with with our SUAS program. Yeah, I was going to ask like what what kind of missions can we do with with those kinds of drones? So uh, already we've had uh, two rescues, uh, or two finds, I should say, with the regular Skydios. Mm. Um, one was in North Carolina, and I'm completely blanking on where the second one was. That's okay. Um, but I <laughs> want to say it was in the middle of the country somewhere. Probably. The forward-looking infrared Skydio X2Ds give us a lot of additional capability. So we can do things like, A, a we can also use them, obviously, to look for people, because people show up in very nice, bright colors on on the FLIR system. Mm -hmm. So do bears and cougars and other things, and you need to learn to sort of discern what is what when you're looking at them. Yeah. But for the sure. other thing that shows up really nice is things like fires. Um so CAP deployed uh, teams out to the Colorado wildfires oh. to help the firefighters uh, essentially gauge where the fires were spreading, how the fires were spreading, 
because we can see that heat difference on the on the floor cameras. Yeah. And it gives us the ability to sort of say, okay, the fire is spreading this way, so you might want to move your firefighting team over to this area as opposed to where you are now, because right now you're at the tail end of the fire as yeah. opposed to being ahead of it. But so, the drones could melt if you get too close, right? Yeah, I mean, if you get too close, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the nice thing with drones is that they're all governed by Part 107 in the in the FAA system. So mm-hmm. there are there are rules as to where you can fly them. Yep. Okay. So there is the the fixed wing and the quadcopters. Which of the two would you say cadets enjoy more versus senior members enjoying more? And and why do you think they they enjoy the the different types more than the other? So I think that I think that the answer to that question is both groups enjoy the quadcopters more. Okay. Um, just because they're more fun to fly. <laughs> the fixed wing is all computer controlled. So you basically take off and then the computer takes over. Oh. And then all you do is the landing. Oh. Um, whereas the quadcopter, <laughs> you basically fly, unless you're doing a mapping mission, and you can do mapping missions with the quadcopters mm-hmm. as well. Okay. Um, but unless you're doing a mapping mission, you're usually flying them by hand. Ooh. So they're more fun. They're more fun to practice with. Mm-hmm. Um, we do a test called the NIST Bucket Challenge, which is essentially like five buckets on a pole. Uh, one bucket straight up and then four on a 45 degree angle. Okay. Um, and it's a series of three buckets. And the goal is to get various maneuvers. So certain altitudes, take a picture you know, straight down, take a picture 45 higher take a picture 45 of the last bucket Hmm. back down and then fly traverse around the buckets and get photos of like all the interior buckets on the outside Hmm. so it's a hand eye it's a hand eye coordination thing okay um but it's also a does does the pilot have the ability to get good photos question yeah uh we did them a lot at nisa which i highly recommend and i know you've done a video on on nisa Mm-hmm. I highly recommend it for, for learning SUAS. It was an amazing experience. And you get to play with both of the drones. And N- NISA is the National Emergency Services Academy for Situational Awareness, for those who, who don't know what that is. Yeah. 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 And sometimes uh, sometimes uh, regions do it. So we have a Northeast Regional Emergency Services Academy mm-hmm. coming up in July, where I will be teaching drones. But yeah, so the so basically the the bucket challenge is theoretically timed for ten minutes, although CAP doesn't actually do the timing. Okay. Uh, just because it, the program is so new and we don't have enough people that that could do it right off the top of the bat. So if we were if we were setting people at ten minutes, we wouldn't have a lot of drone pilots yet. Yep, that's fair. But um, I'll let you in on a little secret, which was that every single cadet did it in under eight in in, in under ten minutes on their first try. Most were around eight. That's pretty good. A, I don't think a single senior broke 10 minutes on their first flight. Oh, no. Oh, the senior members. Oh, it's okay. They, but they practice and they become more proficient after practicing. I think Correct. it's that dexterity thing, the thumb dexterity and being comfortable with joysticks. Cause, it is. Because, like, I, that's not something that all senior members have experience with. No, and it's also the ability to sort of think outside the box because mm-hmm. for the second half of the test, the drone is flying sideways oh yeah that's fair so so now you have to suddenly shift your brain that okay (laughs) forward is no longer forward forward is now the left and right controller that's pretty good so so you have to start thinking about that but by the end of the uh the end of the week there the first week um every single person had broken the 10 minute mark well that's wonderful would you say that taking photos with the suas is similar to like airborne photography and so like if someone who has experience with airborne photography was interested it would translate well into suas or is it very different in terms of skill set so it translates relatively well there are differences in the photos that you can take one of the advantages of of having the suas for example is uh take the example of a bridge Mm. um from an airborne photography perspective i can get photos of the top of the bridge I can most likely get photos from the obliques and 45 degree angles of the bridge. Mm -hmm. But if a hurricane has just gone through, the question isn't really, okay, so the bridge looks fine from above. 
but what about the buttresses underneath? Yeah. I can get underneath the bridge with the drone. I can look up at the buttresses as opposed to trying to get them from an airplane where I can't see them. That's fair. So it has a different application, and they work very well together Okay, is sort of the end result, is, is you want both. Um, I can get the above shots from the drone. I can take a drone up to 400 feet and yeah. get the above shots. I can also get the close-ups with the drone that you can't get with an aerial with an aerial camera because I can mm -hmm. get I can get right next to the bridge. Yep. So if there's a crack that's identified from an aerial photography, we can get right up next to it and see what that crack really is. And sort of related, how far is the range for the drones? Is it dependent on the battery? Because it's, like if, if if I'm thinking about like there's let's say there's like a bridge that you need to go check on, and the bridge is like a mile away. And you can't get to it because the road's been washed out. Is, so, is that even feasible at that point? Or would you only be able to like go up in one of the Cessnas and try to get footage from the plane? So the drone has about a six mile range. Okay. Um, the tricky thing is that the way that CAP operates them is you have to operate them under what's called, uh, or, or rather you can't operate them under what's called BVLOS, Beyond Visual Line of Sight. Mm. So if I'm going to go check that bridge out, most likely it means I'm going to have to bring my drone with me in a case, park the car somewhere, and start walking. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing is that you're never flying the drone alone. You're always flying it at a minimum of two people. Okay. So there's usually a mission pilot and a technician, although the technician doesn't need to be drone certified. They could just be a visual observer. Hmm. Okay. Um, and we'll get into it a little bit in, in one of your future videos. But one of the really cool things is that that the technician and mission pilot, SQTRs, the, the technical documents for qualification, some of the items in that are also on the mission scanner checklist and on the aerial photography checklist. Hmm. So there is, there is absolutely overlap between those three those three areas yeah the one that i think should be on there that's not is is udf and ground team there should be some overlap there because yeah cap treats us very weird we are an air asset that deploys with ground teams yes that's what so makes us strong it it is and it makes us very bizarre and weird too <laughs> yeah because the sus teams have absolutely zero requirement any ground team skills whatsoever. Oh, no. Do you at least have to have, like, a 24-hour pack? No. Oh, no. Oh, no. no. Oh, because, no. Because all of our packs are provided by CAP. So CAP, if, if we deploy for a mission, what? CAP provides what's called a flat pack for us. Um, it's essentially a pallet. It's actually, I think it's two or three pallets that come with everything that we need. So we don't actually have to have anything like in our own personal gear, aside from, you know, the uniforms that we need to go deploy. What? And quite honestly, I'm not deploying a pallet into the field. That's going to be plopped somewhere for me by CAP. <laughs> I'll put what I need on a truck, and then we go and, and you know, do our thing. Yeah, no. I would, I would just bring my own stuff. But, like, if people don't know what they need to bring, and they just have the SUAS qualification... That, that it, it, it is why one of my standing recommendations to CAP <laughs> is that we actually should, if not require a ground team, highly encourage. Well, no, most times like they have like the prerequisites, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to be a mission radio operator before you can be a communications unit leader. Right. And like I do agree, like UDF, I think has like a smaller list of things that you need to bring with you than GTM three. So maybe like yeah. a condensed pack check. Yeah. For SUAS at a minimum, but I, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I'm UDF qualified as well, so that, that makes it easier for me. I at least have a pack that's that's already prepped for UDF. Mm -hmm. um, but UDF, normally we're not going out overnight, no. so I don't have an overnight kit in the UDF gear, but at least I have, you know, intelligent things like extra socks and Extra socks, very important. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Um, there's always a sleeping bag in the back of my car, just in case. Yeah, that's good. So, the SUS program is fairly new in CAP. It's not more than, I want to say, 
five years old. Yeah, I would say about five, 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 or, five or six years old. Yeah. Um, we're slowly starting to get more and more mission pilots qualified. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is through work of people like myself who apparently have more free time than, than you know, oh. is sane. Um, really just driving around the state and working with people. Mm -hmm. So so thank you everyone for watching and thank you Martin for, for joining me to talk a little bit about an introduction to SUAS. In one of our next videos, we're going to be talking about how do units, local units, get involved with the SUAS program. So thank you everyone. Bye-bye.